For those of you who are trickling in, please, let's, let's come on down to the lower level. Fill in the audience here. It'd be great. We're not that scary. Um, so it, I think this is the last session of the conference, uh, and we should go ahead and get started. So my name is Asa Paley, and I'm very pleased to present our next speaker, Dan Goldstein. Um, Dan is Senior Principal Research Manager at Microsoft Research in New York. He's also a distinguished scholar and adjunct professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dan has a background in both computer science and cognitive psychology, uh, and his work spans many different fields, ranging from data science to behavioral economics to human and algorithmic decision-making and artificial intelligence, uh, and his work on heuristics, choice architecture, financial decision-making, and elicitation and aggregation of judgments uh, have made major contributions to the field of psychology decision analysis, economics, and computer science. His work has been awarded uh, several US patents and has been cited more than 29,000 times, according to Google Scholar, 29,000, which is pretty impressive. Uh, but more importantly, he has published multiple papers in the International Journal of Forecasting. Uh, including one of my favorites, which is titled Fast and Frugal Forecasting. Uh, over the course of his career, he's worked in both academia and industry, including time as a tenure-track faculty at the London Business School and work at Fatwire Corporation, Yahoo, and Microsoft. I also learned from his website that he had a secret past life as a theater director and performer doing improvisational comedy including an appearance on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. Uh, now, I may be biased. Sorry, that was my attempt at improvisational comedy. <laughs> it's only going to work for this audience. I may be biased, but I've been looking forward to this keynote all week, so without further delay, I'll hand things over to Dan, who will be talking about the role of judgment in forecasting. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Asa. Um, all right, so I'm not going to be funny if that was what you were expecting with, with the setup. I, I, I just can't do that. Um, so this is the title. Um, the title is really to just, they told me we want to keep everybody at the end of the conference. You have to have a very big, impressive title that keeps people here. No one can cover the role of judgment in forecasting in an hour. That's, that's crazy. But we do have a plan. We're going to talk about um, some, some new research and some positive research on improving decision making. And the big picture that will shape the presentation is the following observation, which is that people tend to make better decisions when they use models more. Right? Uh, I just actually came from a presentation which said you know, the, the evidence on whether people can um, adjust, improve models by adjusting them is mixed, but it's not really mixed in the sense that most of the evidence is that people don't uh, improve models. As they adjust them, they make them worse. And as models get smarter and smarter, that's going to be more and more the case. So they're kind of mixed like vermouth and gin are mixed in a martini. Like There's mostly uh, one side to the evidence. And we're going to talk about two ways to exploit this fact to improve decision making. So one is a technique called judgmental bootstrapping. Raise your hand if you've heard of judgmental bootstrapping before. OK, I'd say about 3% of <laughs> uh, people. And the other is a technique called uh, model-assisted estimation. Right? And what we're going to do is we're going to put these two techniques together to uh, improve uh, forecasting in a particular domain. So the background about people versus models goes all the way back to the 1950s, Paul Meal, Robin Dawes, and so on, in a literature that was called clinical versus actuarial prediction, or clinical versus statistical prediction, which talks about simple linear models pitted against human experts into, uh, the, you know, on the question of who can make the better decisions on tasks like medical diagnosis, predicting recidivism, uh, for bail decisions, predicting whether businesses will go bankrupt, predicting graduate student success, 
and so much more. And here are some of the classic works uh, from Paul Meal, Robin Dawes, and others on that topic. Um, the upshot of this is that most of the time, uh, and more and more as time goes on, people can benefit from heeding the models more. Uh, even experts adjusting the forecasts less, heeding the models more, uh, can lead to better uh, decisions. But it's difficult to convince people to do that. And I'm going to give, there are many illustrations of this. I'm just going to run through some of those, um, some from my own research, some from others, that demonstrate this, this simple finding. So this is a study uh, that we published recently in which people's task was to try to predict the selling prices of apartments. There are apartments on the Upper West Side of uh, Manhattan. These are actual apartments that really sold. So we knew the ground truth as to what they sold for. We knew uh, all kinds of feature values, such as how many bedrooms they had, bathrooms they had, the square footage, total rooms, and so, and so on. And after doing a number of training uh, tasks in this domain, participants were then uh, shown an apartment here with different features. Uh, and they were either given a model or not, and the model could take different forms. They could see what the model would predict the apartment would sell for, and then they could adjust that prediction uh, to make it better. Now, the models um, varied on two dimensions. Some of them used all eight features. Uh, some of them just used two features. Um, some of them were transparent, like here, where you can sort of see the weights on each feature. Some of them were black boxes where you couldn't see inside the models at all. And so the question when we started this was, what type of model is going to be most helpful in making, ending up with the best estimates for people's predictions? When we got the results, we were surprised um, because it didn't really matter. So here on the um, x-axis, we have the prediction error. So how many uh, dollars off were you when you were predicting the selling price of the apartment on average? And here we have different conditions. So this is a transparent model with two features, a transparent model with eight features, a black box model with two features, a black box model with eight features, or no model at all. You're just guessing, looking at the features of the apartment, you're just guessing what it sold for after training. And you can see right here that when people didn't have a model to help them at all, they were off by about $330,000 per guess on the selling prices of these apartments. Um, but if you gave them a model to look at, they were off by, uh, they, they improved by $100,000, right? And interestingly, it didn't really matter what model you gave them, all of these models, uh, you know, interpretable, uninterpretable, low feature, high feature, they're all making the same predictions in this experiment. They're all pretty good models, but it didn't really matter um, for people's decisions to, to, to adjust the models. They adjusted about all the same. And then importantly, here on the, the dashed line, we see the model's prediction of what the apartment would sell, sell for. And these little confidence intervals show the average of these distributions. And you can see in all the conditions, people were worse off by adjusting the models than they would have been just going with the model's prediction of what the apartment would sell for. So having a model is better than no model at all. And um, people are not adjusting enough towards what the model is predicting. When we sent this out for review, people said, well, maybe the top result is just because nobody can understand the unbelievably expensive uh, price of real estate in Manhattan. So we went out and uh, did a little research and found a little bit hard to believe that in the rest of the United States, like a, a typical apartment could be 10 times less than uh, an apartment in Manhattan for the same size. So we reran the experiment, just dividing all the numbers by 10. And here's the result right here. <laughs> and you can see, instead of being off by $330,000, they're off by $31,000, instead of by 234K, 23K, and so on. It's like really good replication, uh, in my opinion. But it still shows that same basic effect, uh, which is that having a model is better than no model. And people would have done better trusting the model completely. And we're, but we're going to see a case where adjusting a model's prediction is necessary, and I think we're doing this research because I think we all believe that for a long time it's going to be necessary for people to put their judgment uh, into, uh, they're going to have to combine their judgment with the predictions of models to make good decisions. 
Here's a study by um, <clears throat> Log, Minson, and Moore showing that experts are not averse to this. So in this uh, study, they basically uh, here, this is Breyer score right here. People are given geopolitical forecasting questions. So higher is worse, lower is better. They ask questions to lay people and experts, and they gave them the output of a model to consider before they answered. And they were told that either the model came from human beings or came from algorithms. So two things to note in this is that lay people did better than the experts in both conditions, right? Um, and second, uh, lay pe the, the difference between lay people and experts was even greater when the experts were told that the prediction was coming from an algorithm. All right, so experts were somehow more algorithm averse. This kind of relates to a session that I was just in a couple talks ago. And their greater uh, aversion to the algorithm led them to make much worse predictions uh, than lay people. So again, more evidence that people could use models more and improve and experts are not immune. Speaking of experts here, this is from another paper of mine. This is the reference. If you're interested, this is looking at the decision of judges to bail or release people after they are arrested before uh, their court date. And so you have two axes on which to think about these decisions. You uh, can release all of the arrested people at 100% or uh, let's say 25% of the arrested people here. And then you are also concerned about the proportion of those people you release that fail to show up for their court date. So this is generally worse, right? A lot of people don't appear and uh, you don't release very many people and this is better. You're releasing more people and the people that you release tend to appear uh, in court. These circles are the performance of human judges, uh, actual New York uh, judges on this task. And you, know, you can see, and this black dot is the average of the human judges. So the average of the human judges, they release about 70% of the people and they fail to show up for court about 13% of the time. To doing some fitting some pretty simple uh, machine learning models like a random forest or a lasso regression, you can do better than most of the human judges. That is, you're releasing more people and having a lower uh, failure to appear rate. Um, but interestingly, here, and this was the contribution of this paper, these red dots show the predictions of a simple heuristic. So this heuristic basically is something that you could memorize in about five minutes. It just looks at two variables, the age of the person and how many times they failed to show up in the past. And just using those two variables, you can pretty much tie uh, one, of the re one of the machine learning models and beat most of the judges. So it's not that people are unable to match the performance of these uh, models, it's that you know, even simple models, if people were to internalize them, they would improve their, their uh, decision-making behavior. So let's return to the big picture. I don't want this to make this a negative thing about people. I want to try to use this fact about people to improve human judgment in an important domain, the domain of out-of-domain uh, prediction. So people make better decisions when they use models more. It's generally true. It's mixed, but it's generally true. What are two things we can do with this fact? So the first is we can do something called judgmental bootstrapping, which is the idea <clears throat> that you replace your own estimate with a model of your own estimate, right? So you train a model on some of your own estimates, and then you use that model instead of your own estimate the next time around. That's judgmental bootstrapping. And then the second part is called model-assisted estimation, which is basically saying when you're training this model on your own estimates, instead of just um, doing it blind, like the people who are trying to guess the price of the apartments with, with no information at all other than the features, what if you're looking at the performance, what if you're looking at a model that's making a, a prediction of what that apartment might sell for, even if that model is wildly incorrect, even if that model is trained on another city or, or something like that, might looking at the predictions of a model while you're estimating something um, improve your estimates and thus when you do judgmental bootstrapping and you model your estimates, improves the whole process all along. And that's what we're gonna do today. This is the two-step thing that we're gonna do today. So we're gonna take this procedure called judgmental bootstrapping and we're going to um, improve it and call it model-assisted judgmental bootstrapping and this was a project that we worked on 
last year with a number of people, Matt Hardy, Jay Kaufman, Jessica Holman, Sam Zhang, and myself, all connected uh, to Microsoft Research and Princeton and Northwestern University, and University of Colorado. Um, so here's the motivating problem for this task. And I think this is something a lot of you can relate to professionally. You're trying to train a model to make predictions in a domain where you have no training data. So it's not just the cold start problem, it's not just you wanna predict about something similar, but there's a domain that's really different and you have no data at all, but you need to uh, fit a model to make predictions in that domain. So what, are, what could be some examples of this? Here's two, you could actually think of an enormous number of examples of this kind of case, but here's one, let's say a vet you know, has a model of how chimpanzees respond to a certain drug, it could be an antiviral drug, it could be a sedative, it could be something. They wanna predict how a lion will react to the same drug because they have to do something urgently on a large population of lions. You can imagine this in a medical context with human beings training a model in one country population, trying to apply it in a very different uh, set of circumstances on people who are very different physically, for instance, in terms of BMI uh, and so on. Second, let's say there's a restaurant, and this is an example that we'll walk through. The restaurant only exists in uh, California, and you, for whatever reason, are thinking about opening a branch of this restaurant in, say, Karachi, Pakistan, where it has never existed before. How could you train a model to make predictions in this domain when you have no training data at all? So these are examples of really going out of domain in your predictions. So to, to flesh it out a bit, Let's take In-N-Out Burger as a case in point. So In-N-Out Burger, if you haven't heard of it, is a fast food chain, uh, mostly in uh, the West Coast, in California, although there seems to be one in uh, Texas, as, uh, some in Texas as well. And if you want to open a new In-N-Out Burger branch um, in the yellow region where they exist, it's not too difficult, it's just a case of in-domain prediction. So here we can see there's no In-N-Out Burger in San Luis Obispo, California, but there is one uh, nearby uh, to the north and to the south. And so you could just do this as a classic forecasting progress problem. You're trying to predict store sales in this new location where you're thinking about opening a store, but you don't have any data. And you have a model which tends to predict sales pretty well based on the population density, the foot traffic, the month, the uh, temperature variations, things like that. So you could train your California model uh, and use it to make predictions for your new location. But now, what happens if you're going really, really out of domain? So you wanna open one in Karachi, Pakistan. And you have a sense that the model that you trained uh, for California cities is not going to do very well uh, very far out of domain like this. You have no idea if this restaurant is going to be completely rejected out of hand and no one will go there, or if it's going to be embraced wildly by the young population there and be a raging success. You really have no idea. You've never opened a branch in this country. You don't know anything at all. So what do you do? Well, you're probably thinking to yourselves, I know what I would do. This is just the domain of good old fashioned prediction markets, polling, asking experts, getting judgments, and so on. And I agree. Um, what you could do is you could ask people to guess, if you're trying to train a model that's gonna predict what's gonna happen there, you could try to have people guess ground truth values, if these people are experts, um, and then fit a model to those guesses, and then your problem is solved, at least at the outset. Um, until you actually have data, you can see what the, what sales might be there. So you're gonna have people guess and you're gonna fit model to those guesses. The objective, the whole objective of the presentation today is we wanna find ways to improve these guesses, right? When we're asking these experts, what are my sales gonna be like in Karachi? We wanna get the best estimates possible to train the best model possible. And we're gonna propose and test two different techniques, as I mentioned to get this done. So one is model-assisted estimation. We're gonna let people have access to a model while they decide. And two, we're gonna use judgmental bootstrapping. We're gonna replace people with models of themselves. And so we're gonna give it the mouthful of a name, model-assisted judgmental bootstrapping. So model-assisted estimation, this is the, just one part of it, 
is you're giving people access to an in-domain model to help them make out-of-domain predictions, right? So in the case of this fast food restaurant, you'd basically be showing your experts sales figures from um, a, a, a California city while they're trying to make the prediction for Karachi, Pakistan. And you know that this model is the wrong model. <laughs> you know it's inappropriate, you know it's, it's not based on any reasonable training data or any expertise at all, but you're asking the question, is it better than nothing? Is it better than nothing to look at uh, something that's clearly from the wrong domain when you're trying to predict from another domain, or should you just make it a blank slate question, let people, let the experts leave them alone, let them use whatever resources they have and try to make their predictions from a blank slate. So that's the idea of model-assisted estimation, is you give people predictions on the wrong model, you call predict on the wrong model to help educate their guesses uh, in a new domain. And then the other idea is judgmental bootstrapping. So since only a few of you had heard of judgmental bootstrapping, I'll, I'll describe what I consider to be like the quintessential judgmental bootstrapping study from the 1960s where again, you're replacing a person with a model of themselves. So consider this task, you have an expert, their job is to sit in a bank and to predict whether businesses will go bankrupt or not, okay? And this is your expert, and so you can give them, let's say, a stack of 60 pieces of paper. Each piece of paper has the, has the features of a business on it, and they can look at it, and they can put it in one of two piles, bankrupt or not bankrupt. So they do this 60 times. Then what you do is you train a model to predict what this expert does, right? You don't look at the ground truth at all, you just try to model their predictions of whether the business will go bankrupt or not go bankrupt, okay? Good, so now you have your model that models the expert as opposed to actual bankruptcy. So then you come along and you get 60 new pages, 60 new uh, cases, and you give them to the expert to classify, and you give them to the model that you just trained on the expert. And which do you think does better? Well, I probably wouldn't be asking you, but the surprising finding is that the model trained on the expert tends to do better than the expert uh, herself or himself. So, or their self, that's better. Um, right, and there's a number of reasons why this could be. It could be that the, the model is more consistent, and the expert, it could be that the model has learned to trade off values in a way that are a little bit too difficult for people to do uh, on single cases, but for whatever reason, judgmental bootstrapping tends to work um, when, when you actually compare it to the ground truth, a model of yourself can beat yourself. And so that's the other thing we're gonna try to do in this domain, instead of um, having people just guess, like in polling or in prediction marks and so on, and just aggregating through simple means, we're gonna have people take a lot of guesses, fit models to their guesses, and then instead of taking their guess for the critical questions, we're going to use a, a model of them to make a guess for the critical question. So that's the other part of the new idea. So one is model assistance while you're estimating, two is judgmental bootstrapping or using a model of an expert instead of an expert for the final thing. Now, judgmental bootstrapping, as I mentioned, it was, it was you know, I think the first paper is in 1961. Um, it's, there is some interest on it, you know, there's, a, there's like a chapter on it in Principles of Forecasting by Armstrong, but you can see that, you know, most of the citations are in the uh, uh, 20th century, even if you go uh, more recently, it didn't get that much attention. Um, there are not that many studies on judgmental uh, forecasting, and they tend to be pretty small, you know, with maybe 100 experts at most. So what we're going to try to do today is find a way to replace experts with lay people who are experts at some things, uh, and bring the number of participants up to 1,440, and we're going to look at more cases, right? So instead of like 120 businesses for bankruptcy, we're going to look at 252, oops, um, cases. Uh, for, for predicting and testing. I and mean, each person's gonna be looking at 26. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? What we're gonna do is use the domain of temperature estimation. So we're gonna pretend that uh, temperatures 
in distant cities are unknown because they are unknown to the experimental uh, participant. And so this is a kind of simulation of out of domain prediction, right? So if I asked you to predict the high temperature in April in Lagos, Nigeria, and you don't know it, right, but you do know the, the weather in the city where you live, then that for you is a case of out of domain prediction, right? And so that was the, the question that we decided to ask uh, a lot of people. And so here are, here is like a representation of high temperature data. So you can see in New York City, for instance, the high average high temperature in the month of January is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and the hottest month is July, where it's a little bit over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And what's nice about this domain of temperature forecasting is that we can simulate expertise, right? Because presumably you'd be dealing with experts when you're doing this judgmental uh, bootstrapping thing for out of domain prediction, but experts are very difficult uh, to study. It's hard to get a lot of experts to come together and participate in your experiments, but everybody's an expert in weather <laughs> and everybody's very naive in weather about places that they're extremely unfamiliar with. So by varying the proximity of the cities that we're asking about, we can make people either experts um, or lay people about this particular domain um, and see how expertise affects performance. In addition, we can ask people lots of questions about how much they know about weather forecasting and use that information to see how expertise might matter in this domain. So we're gonna divide people into two conditions in this experiment. In one condition, uh, people are just gonna predict the weather with no help from a model at all. So I could just ask you, predict the weather in San Antonio, Texas in January. Asa, what do you, what do you think it is? High. In January? Average high. 60 degrees. 60 degrees. Um, and then people, not unlike our participant here, uh, <laughs> will type in their, their answers, and as they type in these numbers, a little graph will form uh, on the user interface, and when they're happy, they can click uh, Submit Responses. And there we get their guesses for uh, San Antonio. That's the control condition. This is when you don't have model assistance. One of our contributions here is to test whether model assistance is gonna help you do this, but do it out of domain, uh, perhaps, when your model is very inappropriate for the place that you're predicting about. Like for example, let's say, uh, so does viewing the model for the wrong city help uh, for the target city? So let's say your task is now predict the weather in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> These are all US based participants, okay? But you're gonna get some model assistance. You're gonna be able to uh, call predict on one of these US cities, one of 18 US cities. The participant picks the city they want to see the predictions for, and they can look at those predictions when they're making predictions for Sydney, Australia. Okay, so what's the dirty little secret about the weather in Sydney, Australia? It's the opposite <laughs> of in the Northern Hemisphere, right? Our summer is their winter, their uh, winter is our summer, and so on. So when you're seeing predictions from a model, let's say for instance, this person says, show me Los Angeles to predict uh, Sydney. Maybe they've seen pictures of Sydney and they realize they both have palm trees, so they think Los Angeles would be uh, a good uh, thing to look at. They might be tripped up by the fact that Sydney, in actuality, is gonna be warm here and here and cold here, right? So if we actually put up the values for Sydney, you can see that it flips around, right? So here, we would expect this possibly to have a damaging effect, but we didn't really know. Maybe it would have a helpful effect because you're just seeing some predictions and if people can make some model adjustments, right? If they have enough expertise to make some basic adjustments like move a prediction up or down or you know, flip a slope around or invert something, spin something around mentally, then maybe this could actually help and lead to better predictions. Does that make sense? So that's the that's the idea behind this intervention, is you let people predict, you let people call predict on whatever model they want when they're, when they're estimating something as opposed to having no help at all, like in the control condition, and then you see whether seeing the wrong predictions is gonna help you make better out of domain predictions. Okay, so we wanted to, again, vary expertise for these US subjects, so we 
wanted to pick cities that are going to be easy for them, challenging for them, and difficult for them. So we call this a kind domain, a challenging domain, and a wicked domain. Uh, in particular, the kind domain uh, is, these are US-based participants, the model cities are US cities, and the target cities that they're trying to predict are all US cities. So this should be pretty easy. This is just like basically the cold start problem, calling something, calling a model on something slightly different. Um, the challenging domain in the middle, these are cities that are outside of the US where probably the participants have not been before, um, but they're all in the Northern Hemisphere. So at least the summer and winter should be lined up and they just need to kind of maybe shift them up and down and think about you know, whether they're more flat or more peaked, uh, depending on proximity to water or something like that. And then lastly, the wicked domain cities, uh, the domain is wicked because they're all in the Southern Hemisphere, so they all have this inverse pattern. They are summer when the North America is winter and vice versa. And we picked these cities very systematically. We just went down a list of cities by population um, and had some constraints about diversity um, over continents and things like that to end up with these sets. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so now everybody can either be a relative expert or a relative noob, uh, depending on what kind of city we ask them about. We um, had these two conditions, randomly assigned 1,440 people to them. Everybody made decisions about three target cities. So we saw one randomly chosen kind city, one randomly chosen challenging city, one randomly chosen wicked city, and they made guesses for every single month of the year. And we ran this on Mechanical Turk. This was uh, a year ago before Mechanical Turk got completely taken over by uh, AI chatbots. <laughs> um, and these people actually, uh, you'll see, they made reasonably good uh, answers. And we had a very high criterion for the Mechanical Turk workers. People had done 2,500 tasks in the past with a 99% approval rate. So without further ado, let's see how these two interventions do in improving people's out of domain uh, estimation abilities. So model assistance and then judgmental bootstrapping. First, model assistance. Okay, so aggregating across all the conditions in cities, um, people who had model assistance uh, were off by about 12 and a half Fahrenheit degrees. Uh, but people who didn't have model assistance, that is people who couldn't see another city while they were making guesses, they were off by about 16 Fahrenheit degrees. So three and a half out of 16, that's a pretty sizable improvement in accuracy. And so this is just the mean absolute error, how many degrees off you are across all of the cities and all of the conditions. We can break this down by the domain where they, the kind cities, the challenging cities, or the wicked cities. So again, in the kind cities here in the left two bars, these are using US cities as your model that you can see when you're predicting about US cities. Um, you can see having the, uh, the, mo the model assistance there helped a great deal. Right? You can see a very large uh, improvement between uh, model assistance and no model assistance. Um, you also see an improvement in the challenging trials. And surprisingly, you even see improvement in the wicked trials. So even though you were seeing, you're trying to predict about a city with the inverse weather pattern, seeing a prediction from the wrong model, <laughs> trained, showing you a calling predict on the wrong city, nonetheless, helps improve the quality of your estimates. Um, but it kind of decreases a little bit, right? You see as the task gets harder and harder, the value of model assistance gets less and less. We can break this down even further um, and look at it for every single one of the cities that we asked about. So here, this is, these are all the US cities on the top, like Baltimore, Charlotte, Denver, um, Orlando, and so on, the red, is the uh, average error in the no model assistance condition. The green is the average error in the model assistance condition. And look at that. For every single city we asked about, model assistance helped. Same with the challenging cities. For every single city, model assistance helped. Or here's one where it's tied. And even for the south, uh, southern hemisphere cities, uh, for just about every city except Santiago, model assistance was helped. Uh, helped significantly so. So it seems like this is generally a good idea. If you're going to have an expert decide something, instead of just 
having a straight up, give me your best guess, or a prediction market, or something like that. Give them a model of something. You can even let them pick what, what they want to see predictions for, which, which we did with the 18 cities, and it seems to help their um, predictions. Now, a fun thing you might enjoy is this question of how good a job did people do at choosing a city that would be like the city that they're trying to predict, right? So you know if you're gonna be predicting for Sydney, you get to pick one of these 18 cities to try to be uh, like Sydney. And so what we do here is for every city, we can show you the actual weather, um, which is uh, this uh, black line here. That's the actual weather in Paris. Uh, and then we can see the most popular city that people chose, which is the red line here. So for Paris, this is the actual, the most popular city chosen by participants was New York City. Um, but the blue cities are the ones that are actually the closest in terms of uh, mean squared error to the target city. So people should have chosen Seattle if they wanted a good stand in for the weather in Paris, but they chose New York. And so some of these make perfect sense, right? So for instance, if you're predicting Baltimore, you'd think that DC, which is right next to Baltimore, would be a good model city. And indeed, it is the most commonly chosen model city and it's quite on top of each other. This is why in the kind domain, things do quite well. Some of you are probably chuckling right here. If you're asked to predict Sacramento, California, what do people do? They say, oh, it's like San Francisco. No, San Francisco is pretty cold. You can see San Francisco right here in red. Um, it's more like Atlanta, right? It's like a very hot southern US city. Um, so that's something that people didn't know. Uh, people got Mexico City pretty wrong. I thought this was interesting. So this is Mexico City here. Its weather is actually like LA, but people think, I know Mexico is in the south, Houston is in the southern United States, they must be similar. But Mexico City, I guess, is at a higher elevation and is relatively cooler. And then here, these are very interesting. Everywhere in the southern hemisphere, people said Miami. <laughs> um, or Tampa, Tampa once. Um, and it's hard to judge how sensible this is because it kind of depends on what mental operation they're gonna do once they see the incorrect prediction, right? So here, yes, San Diego, in terms of like mean squared error, is closest to Sydney's weather. But you know, if you look at Miami um, and you look at Sydney, if people could mentally just spin this around the January, December line, right? They'd get a pretty good prediction for the weather in uh, Sydney, right? Um, so it is a little, a little odd that they always chose Miami, but um, again, despite you know, not having a model city that does a great job or not picking the thing that has the closest deviation, they still were helped by um, model assistance. I think it's straight up mean squared error, yeah. Um, so I, I said we, we gave everybody a little quiz to figure out how much of a weather expert they are. So does this only help noobs and not experts? So this x-axis, so here we have three panels for the kind, challenging, and wicked cities. This x-axis is the degree of weather expertise that they have. It's basically their score on this 10 question weather quiz. Uh, and this axis is error. So you can see, um, this is the difference between people with, no, with low weather expertise, no model assistance versus model assistance. You see it helps a lot. Model assistant helps a lot. Model assistance helps a lot. Model assistant helps a lot in all the three types of cities. But you know, across the board, even for people with a lot of expertise, model assistance still helped. Right? It decreases, but it still helps. It still helps here. They kind of cross over here. I don't know how much weight to put to that, but it seems like Model assistance is uh, suitable for people of all degrees of expertise and for all degrees of challengingness, which to me is kind of an interesting finding, although this is just one domain and we, we should do others. This I think is encouraging uh, for this idea that you should give people some model to look at when they're making estimates. The other part that I promised was I'd look at the effects of judgmental bootstrapping 
while doing this task, and again, judgmental bootstrapping, is replacing yourself with a model of yourself. And we implemented that in a kind of unique way here. So what we would do is we had temperature estimates from a person for all 12 months of the year. And if we wanted to do judgmental bootstrapping, what we would do is we would say, we want to replace this person's guess for October with what the model thinks they would guess in October. So we train a model on the other 11 months and then just call predict on that model for October and then ask what was more accurate, the person's guess of October or the model's prediction of what the person would guess for October. And then doing this, we, I'll preview the results, we find that this works, but we also were a little bit curious and wanted to try something cute and to see if that works too, which is just to say, um, could you do better predicting October's weather if you just took the average of your guess for September and November? And it, you are. <laughs> you are better. Um, and then we did this for every single month, and it's true. Your, people's guesses on average are better for Jan It's better. The December average of December and February is more accurate than people's guess for January. The uh, estimate for February is worse than the average of January and March. The person's estimate for March is worse than the average of February and April, and so on. So I think that's a whole other paper, but it basically says in some domains, if, if things are in a kind of series like this, you might be better off just averaging uh, like all three guesses or like the two bordering guesses as opposed to taking uh, your middle guess uh, alone. So you can do this quite simply just with your own, uh, with your own guesses. So we pre-registered that we were gonna fit a fourth degree polynomial model to the, to the um, people's data, we took the output of the model and we rounded it to the nearest Fahrenheit degree to make it a kind of apples to apples comparison because we knew that people would always state the predictions in uh, integer values and we didn't want the model to win because it was making continuous predictions. And we just fit a separate model to every person for every city, leaving out uh, all 12 months one by one and seeing whether the model fit to the person would beat the person. So how did it do? This is the re these are the results for judgmental bootstrapping. So again, we're looking at the kind domain, the challenging domain, and the wicked domain. And then here, uh, for every subpanel, we have we're looking at whether there's no model assistance or whether there's model assistance, right? So the fact that these two bars are lower than these two bars just shows that model assistance is very helpful, which we already established. But the difference between the green and the red bars shows whether judgmental bootstrapping helps or hurts. So in the kind domain, judgmental bootstrapping doesn't seem to matter. Doesn't help, doesn't hurt either. But in the challenging domain, judgmental bootstrapping starts to help a little bit. And in the wicked domain, judgmental bootstrapping starts to help even more. So what's kind of cool about this graph, which by the way, reflects all of the results in one picture, is that you can see model assistance, its effect kind of washes out as you go from the kind to the challenging domain, right? There's a big effect of model assistance here, but not here. But judgmental bootstrapping has the opposite pattern. It doesn't really help in the kind domain, and it helps a lot in the wicked domain. So when you put the two things together, you get pretty, you get help, you know, kind of miraculously across the board, right? One helps where the other doesn't. And, um, you know, if you just, if you say most of the times where you would use this kind of model-assisted judgmental bootstrapping would be a challenging domain, right? Such as taking a U.S. city and trying to make a prediction about uh, a city in Asia or something like that in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see, you know, by doing both of these uh, interventions, you can take the error again from, you know, up here over 15 to uh, down here around uh, 12 or so. So it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big error reduction by putting these these two things together. So wrapping up, looking at potentially inappropriate predictions from an in-domain model can help people make out-of-domain predictions. Um, and I think it's something that we should be doing when we're eliciting information from experts, based on what I know right now. Um, observing the inappropriate predictions did not hurt um, in any case, it only tied. Um, the benefits of this model assistance decreased as the tasks got harder and harder, but the benefits of judgmental Bootstrapping increased as the tasks got harder and harder. So together, they, they work kind of well. So we can take this tendency 
that people do better when they lean on models more and, again, use it in these two different ways. One, replace people with models of themselves. That's one way to get them to use models more is to just ask them for their opinion and model it. And two, we can show them models while they're making estimates, and that seems to have a pretty reliable effect in improving, in improving uh, their out-of-domain estimates as well. So that is it right now, and thank you very much. If you have any questions that occur to you afterwards, I'm happy to um, take them by, by email. We'll do, you can do some questions here. Yeah, uh, we haven't yet submitted this, um, so you know, any thoughts, um, connections to other literatures, things like that, I, I think we do have interested for, in hearing. For a couple questions. If yeah, sure. <laughs> Finally get to ask a question. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for a great talk. Um, how much of this is, are there any limits to what, what's considered like out of scope? Like temperature in a different city still seems like the pattern is somehow in, related or inspirational or gives directionality. How far off can I be? Like I'm not going to ask them something totally nonsensical, like, I don't know, viewership of a Netflix show if I'm trying to predict forecasts. So how far off can that question be uh, when we kind of relate them? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we, we thought just in this domain we would go too far off when we were asking the southern hemisphere cities. We thought that would break it and we would see like the limits of where it, where it falls apart. We didn't see that. So we, in the temperature domain, we don't really know where to go. Next, I mean, I guess we could, we could ask about other planets, but um, um, yeah. So that is that is, a, I guess, an area for future research is to like figure out what are the limits of this, is how inappropriate a model can you show people and still get, um, you know, help there. And maybe, maybe for the quants in the room, that's that's a, that's an answer that has uh, like, uh, you know, a more analytical solution as well. I mean, you could find the conditions under which the inappropriateness of the model, they could prove why this is working. Um, but yeah, I agree. The f people are people, we can only live in certain temperatures. So it's not that surprising that right, any, any livable city on, on Earth might not be too bad of a prediction in this domain. But yeah, you can easily think of scenarios where maybe it wouldn't help at all. <laughs> wouldn't help at all. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, have you checked out the distributions of the errors? Are they bimodal? Yeah. You mean for the southern hemisphere? Uh, for either, really. I mean, just um, the asymmetry on the, uh, what people guess relative to the model predictions. Um, so here you can kind of see individual predictions in both conditions, right? So for um, these, these uh, let's see, red is no model assistance, right? And so you can see some of the people with no model assistance get it the right way, some people get it the wrong way. Um, with model assistance, you can see these blue ones, they're arching here, so e some people are doing the wrong thing. They're being fooled by the wrong city and just kind of copying what they're seeing for the wrong city, but I guess enough people are flipping it around here that in the whole it tends to work out. So it is not helping everybody, right? Some people, some people are fooled, but at least in this domain there's enough people who were making good enough adjustments that it tended to work out. Yeah, and, uh, and just a, a quick follow-up then is um, there, I, I'm a little concerned about uh, the type of model, and let, let's just say a, a model that's biased a certain way. I'm thinking of a recidivism type problem. Uh, and if there's a model that has kind of a racial bias, let's say, in it, uh, are you seeing people, I mean, are they kind of uh, having this anchor point or this model point, I guess, kind of prevents some outliers in your decisions, right? I'm not going to guess too far away from maybe what the model does. But are you seeing people kind of pull down towards what the model predicts? And is there a concern about, you know, a model bias kind of influencing people's decisions in the wrong way? Right. Um, it's a good question. I think I would need to do some studies where, uh, some kind of within participant studies where I could try to see what uh, within a person 
going from no assistance to assistance would do to their predictions. I, I don't know right now in a between uh, setting what, what it's doing in terms of pulling the, the predictions one way or the other. Okay. Yeah. Time for maybe one more. Yeah, I want to ask you your thoughts about uh, uh, the way you are like designing your study. Uh, the way uh, you are dying, uh, doing it right now is like you're anchoring and then letting the uh, law of large numbers kicking in. That's why you are getting the type of results that you are getting. So what are your thoughts about, about this? And uh, my second question is, yes, the results are different for assisted model and uh, unassisted model. But are these results uh, different statistically or not? Thank you. Um, so I'll, as to whether the results for a model assistance versus no model assistance, are they statistically significant? Statistically different? Yeah, I mean, these are, these are sorry, I should have said, these are means plus, plus and minus one standard error. So you can see that this is a several, several standard error difference, maybe 10 or 12 standard error difference in these means here. So these, all these differences are conventionally uh, statistically, statistically significant, some of them, you know, very, very much so. But basically everything here that looks significant uh, is significant. Thanks. Thanks. My, uh, what I have is more of a comment or observation on a lot of what goes on in more traditional forecasting. Imagine macroeconomic forecasting. We've got our forecast going out, and then there's a structural break. There's a war, there's a financial crisis, that sort of thing. And our forecast goes systematically off, and so it's very common for forecasters then to do a judgmental adjustment to those, just shift the forecast up or down to get it back on track. And it has very, it's now known as intercept correction. And even if the structure has changed and the mo original model doesn't represent what's now going on, that turns out to be quite successful. And it seems that what you're doing here is very, very closely related to that. Yeah, I think it is. I think. What we're doing is sort of, it is related to that, and the comparisons that we're making are what would happen if these forecasters, instead of looking at what the model would predict before this structural change, what if they were looking at nothing? And you just ask them to go back to the drawing board and figure things out. So it seems, I guess, a bit reassuring that what they're doing is probably better than <laughs> what they could be doing if they were just trying to drum, drum it up from scratch. But thank you for making that connection. OK, so um, I think in the interest of time, actually, since we're all sitting here and already ready to go, before we were supposed to take a short break, but I think George wanted, there's just a few closing remarks. Um, if we, we can all just sit and stay and end the conference. But before that, let's, let's thank Dan. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.